morning, beloved friends, and welcome to University Church in Yale here at our beloved Battelle Chapel on Yale's old campus. My name is Daryl Hopkins Donnell, and I am a YDS seminarian um, and ministry intern here at UC Rye. On behalf of myself, Reverend Ian, and Reverend Jenny, who is with us in spirit, as well as the rest of the worship team, um, welcome. Welcome to this place of rest, worship, and rejuvenation. Today, our returning liturgical minister and fellow YDS seminary student, Benjamin Geating, will preach, and we will get to hear um, some final pieces from our exiting and yet very beloved musical um, staff. So, let us take this time to rest in the comfort of our beloved community. Find divine love in this sanctuary. This is a time of beloved rest. Let us all be together in this moment of God's grace. Now, Please join me in our call to worship found printed in your bulletin. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us praise God's name together. Even when our hearts are heavy, even when everything feels unhinged, it is our praise that lifts our spirits, that centers us again in grace. For the whole earth is the Lord's. And all the beloved children. Now, please stay risen in body or spirit if you feel willing or able as we join in the hymn found printed in your bulletin. <laughs> Thank you. 
please remain standing. As we worship, we bring with us all the feelings and experiences that we've gone through in the week past. Sometimes those feelings and experiences are tough. Sometimes we don't react well or witness to the hope of our faith. And so we confess to God and each other our sins. I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. God, sometimes our hearts and identities feel fragile. When we face opposition, we shrink or crumble. We long for affirmation and obsess over criticism. Remind us again that we are made in your image, loved as we are, and grounded in your truth. You have made us only a little less than angels. Forgive us when we depend on others for approval. All that matters is whether our hearts align with yours. When we are paralyzed or wounded, touch us, forgive us, and renew us. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Sometimes, many times, O oh God, our efforts fail, but your abundant grace is strong and eternal, and forgiveness is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. I invite you to turn to one another and offer whatever reading of peace feels comfortable. And you can wave to Zoom. <laughs> Please join me for the prayer of illumination. God, let your teaching open your kingdom to us, that we might be both challenged and comforted, grounded and set free. Amen. A reading from Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8. God has taken God's place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say... You are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Alleluia, ye nomu. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 to 56. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. 
Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the good news of the gospel. Christ. You may be seated. Gracious God, whatever is true, may it take. And whatever is false, please help us forget. Amen. I got to tell you, first thing out the gate before I say anything else, goodness, this passage makes me uncomfortable. I squirm a little when I come across it. Can I say that? Is that okay for a preacher to admit? Is there anyone else out there for whom this passage might rub a certain way? Maybe a little unease or perhaps a pause? I think that's good. I think it's good to admit when we face passages like this one full of heavy language that Jesus can be difficult to understand. Such passages remind us that Jesus has things to teach us, that Jesus is not just some other concept to master, and that Jesus challenges our status quo and what we take for granted. Yes, this passage is a doozy, because what Jesus says seems contrary to how Jesus is commonly portrayed. After all, many refer to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Jesus taught their followers to love their neighbor, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. Jesus taught to love and forgive one's enemies. Jesus said, quote, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Jesus was hanging from the cross, Jesus did not take up a sword. Jesus was not the political powerhouse, which Israel expected to galvanize Jerusalem's forces in armed conflict against Rome. And yet, in these verses for today, Jesus says, I came to bring fire to the earth. Also, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And from now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three, they will be divided. And to add to the complexity, all of those peaceful things rightly attributed to Jesus, which I listed off, are in scripture. 
It would be too easy and inappropriate to pretend they do not exist and to proclaim that the passage for this morning cancels out the litany of what is recorded in the Gospels as peaceful attributions to Jesus. In other words, Jesus did a lot for peace, which makes this gospel passage all the more difficult. So what are we to do? What is Jesus getting at? Well, Jesus is many things. Son of God, teacher, advocate, rabbi, and importantly, as Daryl reminded us last week, Jesus is a prophet. And prophets have a long history throughout scripture. In fact, our Bible contains books upon books of prophets. See if any of these ring a bell. Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, see some heads nodding, very good, to name but a few. While each prophet was specific to their context, their common thread is that they are adamant truth tellers. They do not back down. Prophets do not equivocate. Prophets wear their proclamations upon their sleeves as badges of honor. Prophets consider the state of their people and speak the truth. And yes, I use present tense because prophets still exist today. Prophets endeavor to bring about the fullness of God's promises to people, cautioning against extravagance, greed, and the exploitation of those whose basic necessities are intentionally withheld. Our psalm for this morning, thank you for reading, Tommy, functions as one sampling of prophetic literature. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, demands the writer? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and destitute. The writer demands. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hands of the wicked. These are prophetic demands. For the psalmist, The wicked are those who perpetuate the conditions of the poor. The wicked are those who participate in disparities that create orphans. The wicked hoard resources for themselves, the consequences of which maintains a society where it is normal for people to go hungry. In short, for the psalmist, The wicked are those who do not ameliorate the suffering of others. And the psalmist calls for judgment and justice against them. This call for judgment and justice, though, has an important motivation. It is not that the prophet is outright condemning the wicked for condemnation's sake. The motivation behind the prophet's outcry for all the urgent and necessary language employed is actually love. Love for their people, love for their God, and love for the call God has placed upon God's people to do away with unjust conditions. The prophet's cry is critique aimed toward correction. A challenge to provide for others as God has richly provided for God's own people. The prophet does not pursue conflict for the sake of conflict or division, but toward the end of practical action and help. 
It is in this prophetic framework where Jesus' words for this morning find resonance. After all, way back in the beginning of Luke's gospel, in chapter 4, Jesus outlines their ministry as one of prophetic power and possibility. Jesus says, among other things, that Jesus will, quote, bring good news to the poor, that Jesus has been sent to, quote, proclaim release to the captives, and, quote, to set free those who are oppressed. This, my friends, in microcosm, is the entire prophetic enterprise. Bring good news to the poor. Proclaim release to the captives. Set free those who are oppressed. And Jesus bears this prophetic responsibility and shares it with all those who dare to follow suit. Jesus is fulfilling the prophetic task in Jesus' own ministry. And guess what? Prophets side with the marginalized. Prophets side with the oppressed. Prophets endeavor for the prisoner to go free. And Jesus proclaiming Jesus' ministry as prophetic means that God sides with the marginalized. God sides with the oppressed. God endeavors for the prisoner to go free. Jesus proclaims that they are not about peace, but are instead, I believe, about setting things right. Jesus' prophetic task and the task Jesus passes on to those who confess to follow Jesus is to create on earth what reigns in heaven, to make commonplace upon our world as it is where God's presence is perfect. So yes, I guess I agree with Jesus that Jesus did not come to bring peace. I agree with Jesus that Jesus did indeed come to bring division. Because those who speak the truth, who advocate for the poor and the marginalized, like the prophet Jesus, who demand justice for those suffering, cannot have peace in this world where the wicked prosper. To illustrate, allow me to share a story from my own life. Following George Floyd's murder, my previous church organized a crosswalk that functioned as a protest. For those unfamiliar, a crosswalk is when people carry a huge, heavy wooden cross from one station to another, taking turns to carry it. I think all told, our crosswalk was just under two miles long. We did everything by the books, notified police and the town hall, got the correct permits, and everything happened safely. We had a huge showing that ended up inspiring another march that happened a few weeks later in this same town. At the conclusion of our crosswalk, we were elated. We felt that we did something that had never happened in that town before. A hopeful action, we hoped, motivated by love for those around us. After I arrived back home, I noticed a man on the church grounds. He was angrily yelling at people to, quote, go back where you came from, and, quote, that this can never happen here again. I approached him calmly and asked for his name. 
After telling him I helped organize the walk, he grabbed my hand, looked me square in the eye, and told me that should he ever see me again, he would blow me away. Got back in his car, after yelling a few more times at people going home, and speedily drove off. I was shocked. The protest seemed like something necessary and worthwhile to me, yet seemed horrible to this man to the point that he threatened my life. I share this story to illustrate the deep-seated resistance to the kind of life Jesus calls us to, a life where Jesus promises division. And my hope is that the division we experience heartens us even if we don't seek it out for its own sake, that we advocate and act in ways that Jesus did, and that our hearts expand in greater love for those around us, that our Yale-ish tendency to overthink gives way to an expansive love informed by Jesus' life, and that the division we experience in service of God's imagination will not make us afraid because we will never be alone. Amen. Please stand, we'll sing verses one, two, and five. Amen. Please be seated. For our prayers today, you'll notice that uh, the service order is a little different. We're going back to our pre-COVID service order. So the traditional early church order of the sermon, then the hymn, then the prayers, and then the offering. For our prayer time today, I'd like to focus on God being with us in the full spectrum of our moods and emotions. No matter whether we're anxious, happy, distracted, or sad, God is there with us with a word that speaks to whatever we're feeling. Especially as we think ahead to the next few weeks when the arrival of new students and all the emotions that go with those first days, we're grateful for God's steadfast presence with all of us. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you and praise you for moving with us through all our experiences and emotions, especially those we're afraid aren't acceptable to you, even when we don't think of you. Thank you for being with us when the world feels crazy or threatening. 
You know how stressed we have felt. COVID confusion, political hate and violence, flood and drought, the sense that we're not really safe anywhere. Thank you that you have told us over and over again that you are our rock, our shelter, our sanctuary, and help us find that place of peace with you and feel secure enough to let go for a time of our anxieties, to be a bit less vigilant, to trust and to be at peace. Thank you for being with us when we're busy or distracted. Thank you for those times of flow when we're doing what we love and lose ourselves. You are the source of all our gifts and talents and our loves, even when we're feeling empty or disconnected. Still, you place all around us care and companions and joyful surprises. Help us find connections between your grace and all the tasks we have to do and the noise that surrounds us. No moment, no feeling is separated from your love. And thank you for being with us when we're joyful and happy. The psalmist says, I will go out with joy. Thank you for all the good things in our lives. For the healthy birth of Jenny and Kate's daughter, Abby. For all signs of new life around us, for friends and family, for food and shelter and good work to do. For that vast majority of good people who aren't extremists but like us are just trying to find you, truth and beauty in this life. Help us get ready, God of new dimensions to welcome new friends in the coming weeks. Reveal yourself again to us in all the things that come with that experience, the worries, the excitement, the busyness, the celebration. May we find you in all these emotions and events all the different pieces of our life cycle, guiding, protecting, challenging, and uniting us. We thank you for being with us wherever we are. Whatever is going on inside, you are there. And in that spirit, we are bold to pray together the prayer Jesus taught using whatever language or translation is closest to your heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I said, our order is a little different. So we're going from prayers to offering today. Our offering today for those on Zoom is designated to FISH, which is an organization here in the area that serves about 2,500 homebound people with food and help. So there'll be a link that you can click if you'd like to give. And I invite all of you to give generously as God has given generously to you. I'll invite the ushers to come forward. In my
Now if you'll stand, we have an offering song today. giving knows no ending. We offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us. Receive these gifts by your grace. We offer up ourselves in service and praise. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lead Me, Guide Me, and we'll sing it three times, I think. We're going to have choir first, or soloist first, so canter first, and then uh, congregation will sing it back two times. I should be seated for a moment. I thought Ian was going to take my job there for a moment. Um, good morning again, beloved friends. Um, oh, thank you. Many of you probably remember that last week it was a lot warmer here in Battelle Chapel, and so I think this was a much more comfortable service. Um, but I hope everyone felt comfortable to be able to get up and please know that we have um, fans in the back and water along the sides as well. So, um, so if you're new to UC Rye, remember that there are those yellow forms inside. Um, our, the, I did not bring my yellow form up. Inside the bulletins, please feel free to fill one out. Um, any prayer requests or email, any needs or anything. Um, and please feel free to hand it to Pastor Ian, um, Ben, myself, or anyone else on the staff. Um, we would love to get connected with you. Um, and now I would like to um, invite 
um, Pastor Ian up just quickly to thank our wonderful musical staff. I think it was somewhat ironic that Sydney chose our anthem text today, that it said, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. <laughs> and he, Sydney and Noah have endured to the end. So I'll invite them to come up. We wanna wish them well. <laughs> Oh, it's hard to believe the year is over. Sydney and Noah came to us last fall. Uh, Noah uh, as our organist and Sydney as our co-choir director and then stayed with us through the whole summer and have done wonderful work. Uh, Noah Klein is off to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Groton where he'll be serving as organist. And Sydney is off to a DMA program at the University of Michigan. We just wanted to thank them for an amazing year. And now Daryl will lead us in the benediction. Sorry, I also forgot to mention, we will have um, refreshments outside on old campus after uh, church. It will be outside, uh, cold drinks and refreshments will be on old campus. And also um, in the next few weeks, next week is the first year um, arrival Sunday. Please be aware that it will be very busy downtown um, and we expect lots of closed roads and fun noises and things like that. So um, just be aware we are worshiping, we are here, um, but you may need to park a little further away um, and maybe give yourself a little extra time. Um, and then the following Sunday, the 28th, will be the new student welcome service. Um, Pastor Ian will be preaching. And hopefully after we'll have a picnic outdoors with everyone, um, weather permitting. Also, uh, um, Pastor Jenny and um, Kate's baby, Abigail Ruth, is doing very well. Everyone is home and happy. So now let us end with the words from the prophet Micah that we say every week here in Battelle. Please rise, embody your spirit. And with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to move humbly with your God? Move humbly with your God. Amen.
Sydney, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna miss you. That's oh, Michigan. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Good luck. Good luck at Michigan. Thank you. Thank you so much.